Throughout the ages, space has inspired human imagination. Some considered it the kingdom of the gods. For others, the bleak expanse was an unconquerable realm, with the fiercest of dangers lurking around every turn. Mystery will always enshroud the galaxy's limitless expanse. But on July the 20th, 1969, mankind staked a claim on the universe. A new territory had been conquered. But with new worlds come new mysteries. And where there are secrets, there is sure to be fear. With the space race heating up, charting this new frontier was more than just scientific expedition. This was a power play with deadly consequences. As both sides knew, whoever controlled space ruled planet Earth. Once the stuff of science fiction, super ray guns, orbital warfare and planetary annihilation were now within the realm of feasibility. As minds were open to the new and horrifying possibilities of the space race, the world below was blanketed in fear. Fueled by the combustible mix of paranoia and political propaganda, that fear quickly took on a life of its own. And where there was no official explanation to mitigate it, rumor, speculation and duplicity ran rampant. Now, with the historic opening of the Soviet space archives to the West, we can unveil some of the true stories lurking beneath the myth and misconception that define the space race and peer even deeper into the paranoia at its core. In the atmosphere of the Cold War, a kernel of information could snowball into hysteria and overreaction. In the wrong hands, such paranoia could have deadly consequences. Nowhere was that more true than with a radical conspiracy theory that surfaced in 1978. The theory was the Soviets were nearing completion of a super space weapon that would annihilate American targets from above. Some believe that this ultra-covert operation, nicknamed Harvest Moon, had already begun to destroy US spy satellites and that military installations or even cities could be next. And these weren't the delusional musings of a madman. The theory was built upon the concerns of Major General George Keegan, head of US Air Force Intelligence. What had alarmed Keegan most was his suspicion that deep in the hinterlands of Asia, the Soviets had perfected a super weapon. The weapon, Keegan maintained, was a particle beam. Similar to a laser, particle beam weapons fire sub-atomic particles such as protons or electrons with deadly accuracy. Such a weapon could shoot any guided missile or aircraft out of the air and target the Earth with surgical precision. Whichever nation put such weapons into the stratosphere would rule the world. Keegan's contention that the Soviets were winning that race fueled rampant paranoia. According to some sources, the Soviets had already deployed the particle beam device. On September the 26th, 1977, Russia launched the Intercosmos 17 on an alleged research mission. But unconfirmed reports said it had a more menacing military objective, picking off American satellites one by one. Though the CIA could find a shred of evidence to support Keegan's theory that the Soviets were actively developing an effective particle beam weapon, the furor he created spurred the Carter administration to invest huge sums of money in a counter-strategy. The groundwork was laid for the Strategic Defense Initiative, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program, and the world was held in a game of brinkmanship. 
the Reagan administration came in with its rhetoric of the Soviet Union as the evil empire of Star Wars to protect the U.S. homeland from some Soviet retaliatory power. Uh, lots of rather strident rhetoric, and, and I think uh, while the reality, I don't think, ever came close to a, a nuclear attack on the Soviet uh, homeland, uh, that wasn't clear to the Soviet leadership and to the Soviet people. There was a sense of fear. In theory, the high-tech outer space shield was sheer brilliance. In reality, Star Wars was a flop. Not only was it staggeringly expensive, it had some fundamental flaws. It had to have a 100% success rate and could never be adequately tested. Years of research and political battles had been for naught, and all because of a whipped-up suspicion that turned out to be a phantom threat. Today, with the opening of the secret Soviet archives, the CIA's contention was confirmed. No top-secret superweapon was ever documented. The base, thought to house it, turned out to be nothing more than an average nuclear test range. If the Soviets had been planning to shoot American satellites and spacecraft from orbit, it remains a perfectly hidden mystery. In the same ways that the West questioned the Soviets' intentions, the Russians watched the American shuttle program with dread. That fear was spawned not on the fringes of society, but in the mainstream of Soviet political and military leadership. The Soviets were convinced the shuttle was a tool for the Pentagon. They saw it as an anti-satellite weapon and a potential orbital bomber. To counter their mistrust of the American space shuttle, the Soviets began work on a similar project. They called it Buran. Gleb Lozino Lozinski was the chief designer of the Soviet spaceship. Sure, it was a response to the Americans. No one knew what was inside the shuttle. Maybe there was a powerful H-bomb which could be dropped on any point on Earth. That is why there was a decision to produce a competing system. Mutual mistrust locked the United States and Soviet Union in an accelerating spiral of moves and countermoves. Sometimes, actions on one continent were motivated by real events happening on the other. But most of the time, despite the seemingly free press and openness of the West, citizens of both nations were at a loss for accurate information. There was immense suspicion about information that crossed the ocean, deep skepticism of official reports from their own governments. In order to understand this era of distrust and deception, we must go back to the very beginnings of the space race. While the original engineers and designers involved in rocket technology space enthusiasts, those funding this work were not. Progress was funded only in areas that showed a clear and obvious military use. Space exploration came about as a political afterthought and was used not as a means of advancing science but as a tool of political propaganda. Do you ever just go... September the 15th, 1959. Washington welcomes a high-ranking guest from the Soviet Union, Premier Nikita Khrushchev. The number one communist was actually setting foot within the stronghold of capitalism. In the minds of many suspicious Americans, the trip could not be motivated by goodwill. It quickly became apparent that Khrushchev was, in fact, on a propaganda mission. On the first day of his visit, 
He gave President Eisenhower a copy of the medallion that had been delivered to the moon by a Soviet rocket, a potent symbol of the apparent superiority of Soviet space efforts. It was Khrushchev's first of many displays of one-upmanship to the Americans, which would become his trademark. While some people trusted him, most did not. It was with a wary and defensive air that Vice President Nixon acknowledged Soviet advances. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of, your, of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But he didn't believe Khrushchev's claim to be a peacemaker. Nor did he believe that a Soviet medallion had really been delivered to the moon. Like many Americans at the time, Nixon contended that the Soviets were too economically insolvent to continue funding space exploration. Nixon was wrong. For Khrushchev, space was an invaluable propaganda tool. The world had linked space exploration to both technical and ideological superiority. Khrushchev would try to use that clout to gain the alliance of new regimes coming into power throughout the world. Our achievements in space exploration have forced the capitalist world to look at our socialist society from another perspective, including the development of science and industry. The Americans were lagging in the space race, and that deficit was clearly on people's minds during the 1960 presidential debates. The first in other areas of science, but in space, which is the new science, will not work. Now, when we have a presidential candidate, for example, Senator Kennedy, stating over and over again that the United States is second in space. And the fact of the matter is that the space score today is 28 to 8. We've had 28 successful shots, they've had 8. I believe the Soviet Union is first in outer space. We have made, made more shots, the size of their rocket thrust, and all the rest. You yourself said to Khrushchev, you may be ahead of us in rocket thrust, but we're ahead of you in color television. I think that color television is not as important as rocket thrust. The Soviet space booster superiority was born out of defensive necessity. U.S. military bases surrounded their country, putting them within easy reach of American bombers. The Soviets responded by developing larger rockets, capable of flying longer distances. One day, they would be able to use these rockets to threaten American soil. Khrushchev became interested in launching satellites to publicly demonstrate that their rockets were capable of traveling such distances. But after the Sputnik success, he seized upon the space program not only as a threat, but also as a powerful propaganda tool, proof of communism's superiority. But it wasn't all politics. Though world leaders may have envisioned space as the next frontier for Earth's power struggles, others saw it as a new realm for scientific exploration. Practical questions asked about the effects of weightlessness and radiation. Philosophical questions asked whether man was meant to explore the heavens at all. To find the answers, the Soviet Union, and later the United States, started sending animals into space. With the launch of Laika in 1957, the Soviets proved that life could endure in space, orbiting miles above the Earth. Officials were quick to boast their successes, but silent when it came to the end of the story. What's come out in recent years is that the heat shield failed in the case of Laika's launch, and that's how she was killed um, by overexposure to heat and radiation. The chief investigator, Dr. Oleg Gazenko, has recently revealed that he, it's one of the experiments that he regrets in life because he knew that the dog was going to be condemned to death. Scientists felt confident that a human would survive the physical challenges of the journey. But what about the psychological pressures? The animals into space didn't know what was happening to them. They didn't have to contend with anticipation, dread or delusion. These are the demons of the human mind. 
would man go mad in outer space? During their flights, early cosmonauts like German Titov had to prove they were sane before they could operate any equipment aboard the craft. A logic lock was installed and the code was written in an envelope. The idea was that if the cosmonaut needed to operate something, he would first have to perform a normal function. He needed to open the envelope, to read the code number, to key it in on a logic table. He would have to prove he was functioning normally by performing these operations. With an unprecedented historic launch, the Soviets proved that man would not go crazy in space. On April the 12th, 1961, Russia struck its most powerful blow to America's sense of superiority when Yuri Gagarin became the first man to fly in space. Though the flight lasted only 108 minutes, Gagarin became an icon. The hero the Soviet propaganda machine announced it loudly for all the world to hear. We greet you, Yuri Gagarin, daring cosmonaut, and glory to you on this day of triumph. We welcome you back from space as conqueror of the universe. The country and the capital of Moscow greet you. Comrade First Secretary of the Central Committee, the first manned space flight in the world was made on April 12, 1961, aboard the Soviet spacecraft Vostok. Gagarin's mission was described as flawless, but such is the nature of myths. Today, the Soviet archives have yielded a more human story of a nearly tragic flight. As Gagarin's spacecraft plunged back into the Earth's atmosphere, the equipment module didn't jettison as planned. The ship tumbled out of control. As anxious minutes passed, but they oriented for re-entry. If the equipment module didn't separate, the heat shield couldn't work, and Gagarin would meet a fiery death. Gagarin was saved when the module released minutes before re-entry. Despite the passing of nearly 40 years, and a system of government, some Russian officials are reluctant to tarnish this perfect image. At the time, Boris Rushenbach was the deputy designer for manned flights. If we are talking about rumors, I would say that came from the journalists, partly since they just didn't understand. For instance, Gagarin said that before landing, the craft began to twist around, and the journalists thought that was something terrible. But everything was okay with the craft. This isn't the only controversy that surrounded the first flight. All of the early Vostok flights lacked one basic disclosure. The Soviets had not yet perfected the retro-firing necessary to soften the impact of a ground landing. Cosmonauts had to parachute out on the way down. A film commemorating Gagarin's first flight was classified as secret because of this depiction of his parachute ride. In an effort to maintain the appearance of success, all problems were covered up. Rockets exploded without a whisper of explanation. With the world analyzing their every move, their every statement, the Soviets used silence as a political strategy. Such was the case with the cosmonauts. From the beginning, their lives were kept under tight wraps. We were such secret people. 
even at Chkalovsky, where we lived at the beginning, before Star City was built, no one knew who these young lieutenants and several captains were. Early in the morning, a green bus came and took them somewhere, but no one knew where. That secrecy would backfire on the Soviets, drawing intense focus on and where no facts were provided, speculation and rumor filled the gap. Myths, like that of the man abandoned in space, began to circulate throughout the world. Italian amateur radio operators supposedly picked up an SOS signal. It was from a lost Soviet cosmonaut, drifting hopelessly in space. The story was chilling, but fabricated, as were most of the popular tales that persisted in the information void. The list of supposedly dead cosmonauts grew. Stories of disastrous flights, gruesome fatalities, and bodies burned beyond recognition became the mainstay of conversation. Though the narratives were short of fact, the unexplained details kept people whispering. The most persistent of these stories involves a Russian test pilot named Vladimir Ilushin. In 1960, he received the highest military decoration, Hero of the Soviet Union. He was of the highest pedigree. His father, Sergei Ilushin, was a top aircraft designer and a deputy minister in the Supreme Soviet. Shortly after receiving his award, Ilushin began to pursue the goal of becoming the first man in space. Although he was a late arrival to the cosmonaut ranks, his standing as his country's top test pilot and his family's stature placed him at the top of the list. On Friday, April the 7th, 1961, Vladimir Ilushin was launched into space. While the launch was perfect, Ilushin lost consciousness during his third orbit and was therefore unable to perform the necessary parachute ejection at 10 to 20,000 feet. He endured the hard landing without the benefit of retro rockets. Ilushin was barely alive and too battered to be trotted out for an official celebration. International speculation went unanswered. The skepticism only grew when the Soviet government reported that Ilushin had been injured in a car accident. With the launch of Gagarin five days later, the world would forget about the Ilushin controversy and call off their search for the truth. But some sources insist that this cover-up remains and that Vladimir Ilushin was forced to keep quiet so as not to sully the Soviet space reputation. General Ilushin denied ever being in the cosmonaut group. The launch was the last test before the manned launch. The injured cosmonaut, he claimed, was Ivan, the humanoid dummy used in these last tests. While the cosmonauts were enveloped in a shield of secrecy at home, to observers in the West, they were simply and mysteriously disappearing. Rather than acknowledge that any of their cosmonauts ever washed out of the program, the Soviets would simply eliminate any evidence of them. These blatant attempts to rewrite history made the West speculate the worst of fates for these vanished faces. When the Soviet Union originally released pictures of the cosmonauts, they were missing uh, positions in these uh, pictures. Later on, they released the undoctored photographs by mistake, so Western observers could put two and two together and say, well, this man is missing, and he never flew a mission. The truth turns out to be more benign than the suspicions of the time. Grigory Nilyubov was a skilled but egotistical young jet pilot. He was so impressive that he became a leading candidate for the first Soviet space flight, as announced by head of cosmonauts training, General Kamanyan. But after a drunken public brawl, he was dismissed from the program. Neil Yubov was soon flying jets in remote Siberia. Embittered, 
he sank into alcoholism and depression until on February the 18th, 1966, he stepped in front of a train and was killed. This scandalous dismissal didn't fit the cosmonaut image, so Neil Yubov and his companions simply disappeared from the program and from all official photographs. But by rewriting history to reflect just the positive side of their image, the Soviets only added fuel to the worldwide rumor mill. Soon, for every event, questions were raised. For each unanswered question, more rumors sprang up. Now, entire launch missions were doubted. Pride was replaced by mistrust. Space, once an uncharted territory ripe with possibility, was now a forbidding, mysterious, and deceitful void. In the 1960s, with the space race well underway, the world set new targets for exploration. Scientists focused their energies on reaching farther than they ever could have imagined just a few years before. The ball was in motion, but as it began to roll, it set off an avalanche of wild speculation. On May the 25th, 1961, President Kennedy made an impassioned plea that America should commit itself to sending a man to the moon by the end of that decade. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Kennedy, when he proposed Apollo, still wished to cooperate rather than compete. He, he proposed Apollo May the 25th, 1961. Less than a week later, in his first meeting with Khrushchev, he proposed cooperation. As his son remembers, Khrushchev wasn't interested in working with the West. He rejected this proposal, but then two years later, President Kennedy returned to the same point. At that time, I remember my father told me, maybe we will have to accept this offer but our conversation took place maybe two weeks before President Kennedy's assassination and when he was killed, Americans never returned to this point and my father so never went forward. Instead, the Americans and the Soviets kept running the race and fueling the rumor mill. German Titov became the second man in space aboard Vostok 2 in August 1961. He remained in space for almost 24 hours. During his flight, he had experienced space sickness. Perhaps that was the origin of the rumors that started to spread throughout Russia. Titov, they said, was swiftly approaching a gruesome death. Right after the flight, there were rumors that I was exposed to severe radiation, became blind, lost my hair, my wife left me, and many other myths. Some of the stories were even funny. My wife's father came from the Ukraine, and he said, can you believe it? Our neighbor was at the seaside, and some cosmonauts were there as well. They played water polo in a pool, and she said that they were all such brave and healthy boys, except for Titov, who was so thin and yellowish. Much later, after the flight, after our first daughter was born, and then the second one, there was much less talk about my illness. Titov told the truth about his space sickness. The other cosmonauts saw that honest disclosure was not necessarily the proper course of action. Valentina Tereshkova was among them. After Titov's mission was terminated, there were long deliberations. She was already in the cosmonaut group, so she listened to all of this. And she drew her own conclusion. When Tereshkova experienced space sickness, she said nothing. Apparently aware that this did not fit into the Soviet mold of the returning hero. This would be just one of many misconceptions surrounding the mission of the first woman in space. There have been rumors, uh, especially in the West, that uh, 
these propaganda missions, especially, for example, Tereshkova's mission, came from the mind of uh, Nikita Khrushchev. The main driving force of all this was Karolov himself, who have direct access to Khrushchev, to my father. So when Karolov became the uh, most famous unknown secret person in the, wo in the world, he wanted to explore this more and more. The space designers propose the ideas. Then they have to sell these ideas to the military and to the political leadership. The ill-advised launch of Soyuz 1 is one such example. I don't know who argued for it, but personally, I was against that flight. They broke an ironclad rule. No man flight a successful unmanned test flight. When Soyuz 1 ended in the death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov in April 1967, the nation lost a popular figure. But as the public mourned, the government maintained an official silence. Struggling to make sense of his loss, people filled in the blanks. The most graphic accounts of his demise told of his death screams being picked up by US monitoring stations. According to rumor, he knew he was going to die and engaged in last minute farewells to his wife and comrades. It was believed that as his descent began, he reported rising temperatures and that the last sounds heard were those of his tortured shrieks. While the story of Komarov's final minutes is a compelling one, it isn't based in fact. Reports pieced together from his doomed mission show that he was trying desperately to gain control of his vehicle and had little time for farewells. And any disintegrating orbit would have occurred during the normal blackout period when communications are impossible. The story is undoubtedly the product of pure fiction. With the opening of the Soviet space archive, the myth can now be separated from the truth. What really doomed the cosmonaut was a failed parachute. The same fate would have met the crew of the second spacecraft, Bukovsky, Yeliseev, Kronov. The crew would have been doomed, and instead of one, we would have lost four men in two days. Speculation also circulated around Gagarin, and the appearance of a scar on his eyebrow. Rumor claimed there had been an attempt on his life. The real story is far less glamorous. We were on leave together in Foros in the Crimea in 1961, just after my flight. He swung from a rope and smashed his eyebrow against a stone wall. As General Kamanian revealed in his published diary, the story you just heard was also a cover-up. In his official investigation of the incident, Kamanian discovered that Gagarin received the scar, rather than be caught by his wife in a compromising situation with a nurse. Valentina knocked at the door, and in a few seconds, seconds the door opened and there was a young nurse, Anya, 27 years old, stayed here. Valentin asked you, where is Yuri? And he replied, he jumped from the balcony. Gagarin's death in 1968 would kindle another burst of speculation. He had been on a routine training flight and had crashed. Whispered theories circulated. There was conjecture that he was killed because he had developed a paunch and he could no longer live up to his image as a smiling young cosmonaut. It was even said that he could not bear some terrible secret within himself anymore and had killed himself. Rumors about Gagarin's death persisted until Soviet authorities finally opened the files on the official accident investigation in 1987. Sergei Bolotchikovsky led this inquiry. 
And here, in bad weather conditions, with the sudden appearance of another plane, they did a sharp rotational evasion which caused them to go into a corkscrew. Since they had been given incorrect information about the lower cloud cover, they thought they had sufficient height. Today, with great confidence, we can say everything they did during those last tragic minutes of the flight was done with complete competence and good judgment. The Soviets kept the true story cleverly concealed for decades. They knew when to keep quiet, but they also knew when to tout their own victories. The Soviets continued to demonstrate their agility in space. They had already been the first to impact the moon and the first to take pictures of its far side. In January 1966, Luna 9 became the first spacecraft to make a soft landing on the moon. It sent back a wide panoramic view of the lunar surface. Shortly afterwards, Luna 10 would orbit it. In all, the Soviets accomplished a number of lunar firsts. But with the historic landing of Apollo 11, the Americans were first to put men on the moon. Again, the Soviet rumor mill enhanced the story. Modern Russian space mythology states that Armstrong and Aldrin encountered something beyond their wildest dreams on the surface of the moon. Armstrong, they contended, told Mission Control, Oh guys, we're not the first here. Then immediately began to speak in a special NASA code language to tell his superiors what he saw. And what did he see? These myths are so pervasive that Cosmonaut had to inquire for himself. I had to ask this to be able to say that I spoke to Aldrin, who was there in person, and who walked on the moon with Armstrong, and that they didn't see anything. And there was another myth I asked Aldrin about. Did they meet an old Russian man? named Parfiri Ivanov on the moon, almost naked, who helped them re repair and depart from the moon, because there is such a myth in Russia. Aldrin didn't understand me at first. He couldn't believe that I was asking him this. Then he laughed and said, no, they didn't meet a naked Russian who helped them. And the Soviets weren't the only ones harboring doubts about the media spectacle that brought the lunar landing into our living rooms. It seemed so real. But some spectators wondered if it existed anywhere but on television. Are we sure it actually happened? In the United States, a book by William Casing caused quite a stir by suggesting that it didn't. According to Casing, the Apollo spacecraft had lifted off from the launch pad empty. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins were really in a mock-up spacecraft on a soundstage in Nevada, ready to play lead characters in the largest stage play of all time. Though NASA specialists refuted the book, they could do nothing to quash the fervor of conspiracy theories that surrounded its publication. Common knowledge holds that only American astronauts have ever stepped on the lunar surface. But some hopeful and fantastical speculation would dispute this. There is a popular Soviet rumor that the Lunar Code rover, which the Soviets landed on the moon in November 1970, was not automated at all, but maneuvered by a hidden driver. The person who drove the moon rover was a KGB officer. <laughs> this was published. And did we get a laugh when we read it? <laughs> These lunar myths add up to nothing more than good-humored man-in-the-moon stories. But not all seemingly outrageous speculation is the stuff of fiction. Unsolved mysteries, too controversial to be released until now, still surround the Soviet space program. The most highly guarded secrets involve the observation of UFOs.
In probing the great expanse, humankind has always wondered, are we alone? Do we patrol space on our own? Or do we share the galaxy with other from distant worlds? The questions aren't readily answered, but the search engendered a cult of followers, especially in the dawn of the space race. The Soviet Union was able to exploit that fascination with UFOs to their own advantage, hiding their secrets behind the tumult of extraplanetary sightings. The greatest wave of UFO activity in Russian history occurred in 1967. In what some sources claim was a secret series of Soviet space weapons tests, dummy thermonuclear warheads were placed into orbit. They re-entered the atmosphere just after dusk over southwestern Soviet territory. Millions of enthralled observers were hoodwinked, believing they were witnessing UFO flyovers. What they didn't realize was that they were actually witnessing the disintegration of illegal space bombardment weapons tests. For the Soviets, eager to keep the truth hidden, the UFO flurry was the perfect decoy. Instead of clearing up the misconception, an official commission from the Soviet Academy of Sciences decided to run with the outlandish story. They concluded that the explained phenomenon. Both the United States and the Soviet Union exploded nuclear weapons uh, above the atmosphere. This was a period where we didn't know much about nuclear uh, effects and, and it was essentially to find out what happened. Another UFO panic struck the Soviet Union in the late 1970s. But again, it was nothing more than a tool of disinformation meant to cover the nighttime launches from the secret Plesetsk Cosmodrome. Ordinary citizens often misinterpreted this activity as being UFO related. Again, the Soviet government did nothing to discourage these reports. It was less dangerous, they contended, to have people believe in UFOs than to disclose their secret launch facility. There are even those in Russia who contend that for decades there have been numerous close encounters between UFOs and Russian space vehicles. In a recent interview, Professor Vladimir Berdikov claimed that in 1947, the Soviet's chief rocket engineer, Sergei Korolyov, was summoned by Stalin to examine classified reports of UFO sightings. Stalin's suspicions had been stoked by the similarity of the Hiroshima in remote Siberia. On June the 30th, 1908, shortly after 7 a.m., a cylindrical object glowing with a blinding light and brightly burning tail was spotted in the morning sky. Within 10 minutes, while still 6 to 10 kilometers above the ground, it exploded into a tremendous ball of fire instantly destroying an area of over 2,000 square kilometers, scarring the Earth with damage similar to an atomic blast. Korolyov sent an expedition to the crash site in cold, desolate central Siberia. This team of scientists concluded that the unearthly damage was most likely caused by the explosion of an extraterrestrial craft. Speculation about other UFOs persists to this day. It has been reported that while on board the Salyut space station, cosmonauts Klimuk and Sevastyanov saw a silver disc-like object. They radioed Command Central to ask if it could be American. They were told no. But the saucer didn't fade into space. It followed them. Perhaps wavering from pressure, or perhaps trying to convince himself, Klimuk later changed his story, reporting that it was a rubbish container they had dropped the day before. More recently, other cosmonauts on Mir reported seeing lights which they were unable to identify. These lights were later credited as having originated from the Progress cargo vehicle, though why this information wouldn't have been available to mission control at the time of the incident remains a mystery today. On yet another Mir mission, lights were once again reported. 
No official explanation was ever given for this sighting. Are these sightings UFOs? Or just some unexplainable phenomena encountered in space? More honest disclosure may help calm these suspicions. But in a field defined by cover-up, deceit and fabrication, it's perhaps too late to expect that this president can be changed. Political expediency gave impetus and urgency to the Soviet space program. For decades, propaganda kept its truths wrapped up in a tangle of illusion. And sometimes, there was no official story at all. The cosmonaut didn't die. He would simply cease to exist. Space is inherently mysterious. Its sublime expanse exists at the edge of human comprehension and the fringe of sensory perception. Though its frigid void cannot sustain human life, rumors grow heartily in such conditions and can take on a life of their own. Today, we can track the factual origins of the Soviets' greatest myths and misconceptions. But other mysteries, stored deep in their vaults, will forever leave us in wonder, posing unanswerable questions about man's relationship to the galaxy and life in the universe as we know it. You can see part two of our secret space series at the same time tomorrow. After the break, Scientific Frontiers goes beneath the sea.